So we're in Galatians. Uh, last week, we finished up on this verse. Uh, but from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it made no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. To those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. And so that's where Flo left off last week. And that read that verse because the next phrase there in verse 7, but on the contrary, is a continuation of what's going on in verse 6. When they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, slide, uh, had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And again, whatever people Paul was dealing with in the church of Galatia, we call them Judaizing teachers for lack of any better term, uh, trying to impose upon Christians the Old Testament law in order for them to be saved according to these people and Paul's fighting that and arguing against that and telling them no that's not the way that's not the way it works and that point there God shows no favoritism is is a very important uh, important thing for us to understand God is not showing favoritism to the Jews over the Gentiles even but he's fact he's showing that the Gentiles have been brought in on shall we say equal footing with the, with the Jews because there is no, no separation between them. No Jew and Greek, male and female, slave or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And that's the, the message that he's eventually going to get, get to. But the gospel for the uncircumcised has been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. Now, why do you think... Why do you think Paul used the term circumcised there versus Jew, Greek, Jew, Gentile. Why did he use that particular phrase? John? For what it's more encompassing. Okay. Instead of having the numerations of all the other people that are circumcised as the Jews. Okay, the circumcised is the uncircumcised. Les? Uh, this, this is going to be the main issue between the two groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that's exactly why he uses that term because it's not Jew-Gentile. That's not the issue per se. It's the circumcision. And those Judaizing teachers insisting upon that being a part of uh, coming to Christ and being a part of the church. And Paul is saying no. So I think that's why he uses uh, that term circumcision. Uh, and so he is the apostle to the uncircumcised. Peter is the apostle to the circumcised. And he points out there, uh, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And so, uh, again, who's the he there that he's talking about that worked effectively in? God, Holy Spirit, uh, whatever term you want to, uh, to use for, for that. But the gospel to the uncircumcised was committed to Paul. We've talked about this before, but let's remind ourselves Paul is the Jew of Jews. If you could win a gold medal for being a Jew, Paul would have won the platinum, if that's the next bet. Because he was one of those who was just completely and totally zealous for the law. And we asked this question, we've talked about it before, but let's, let's do it just again. Why was he the one chosen to go to the Gentiles rather than to the Jews? Because to me, it would make more sense for him to go to the Jews, wouldn't, wouldn't it to you? Uh, because, I mean, he... He knew them in and out, up and down, and, and everything about them. So why the Gentiles, you think? Ellen? Well, that was God's will. Number well, yeah, number one, God's will, the obviously. Purpose, the whole purpose of them being born, God's mother's womb, was to do this. Mm -hmm. And he was going to suffer a lot about to get through. Sure, absolutely. All right. Any other thoughts? Rick? Did Paul describe himself as being chosen from birth? No. Yeah. Yeah, he said, I was chosen in my mother's womb for this. So God had planned this from before the time that he was even born, that he would do this, that he would be the Jew, the, the apostle to the Gentiles. John and Dave. If somebody who was a quote-unquote lesser Jew was to go to the Gentiles, then all the Jews who held that the Gentiles had to do these things would be able to say, yeah, well, you know, look, look at who's talking to you. He's, he's kind of a mid-grade Jew anyway. 
So you've got the perfect Jew who is telling them they don't have to be circumcised. That's somebody you could you need to listen to. Dave? Absolutely. Peter, the apostle to the Gentiles. That makes sense because where did the gospel go first after Jesus went back to heaven? To the Jews. I mean, it was exclusively to them. It wasn't until uh, the persecution arose and they went and preached in Samaria that they, and again, Samaritans were, as far as the Jews were concerned, they weren't Jews at all, but they were partially Jews in the, in the sense of the bloodline. And then eventually uh, Cornelius and all that that happened with the coming of the Gentiles. But Peter was already firmly entrenched in Judea and preaching the gospel in that area. And so to me it makes sense rather than displaying, uh, uh, take him out of the picture and put him somewhere else, he kept doing that. Then came that transition to the Gentiles. And part of that transition to the Gentiles was the conversion of Paul. So it makes sense, here's our new probably a crass way to say it. Here's our new poster boy, if you will, uh, for Christianity. And since we're changing, since we're going to the Gentiles, he's the new guy on the block. He's going to be the one that we'll send uh, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And we have to remember that while Paul was a super Jew, he was also very well educated, not only in Judaism, but what? Pretty much everything. Uh, I would say that he probably received what we would equate to in our modern times a liberal arts education that encompassed everything, not just Judaism, but the whole world. Uh, he quotes the poets uh, from, from certain places. And, and so he was well educated. So he wasn't just, yes, he was a super, he was just a smart guy, a very intelligent guy. And God was using that as he presented, whether it was to the synagogue when he first went into the town or to the, to the Gentiles, he could speak their language because he had that base of knowledge and then the Holy Spirit on top of that. Sally? And he was a Roman citizen, so he had a passport to wherever he wanted Exactly. To. A Roman citizen. How did he become a Roman citizen? Birth. By birth. And citizen by birth means what? That was the highest level. Yeah, you could buy your citizenship. You could be given citizenship, but if you were born a citizen, that puts you in the top tier of people. And so, like Sally said, he had an open door wherever he wanted to go within the Roman Empire because of that citizenship. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike, we spoke different languages and again, well educated. So, this, this whole point here, I'm preaching to the circumcised, Peter's preaching to the to the end. I'm preaching to the uncircumcised. Peter's preaching to the circumcised. And the point there, though, is worked effectively. It's, it's working. What we're doing is working. And we're going to keep doing it because it is working. Ellen? Yeah, the interesting thing, too, is all of the Jews that were baptized were already circumcised. So Peter has to deal with that because I can imagine that there are some Jews that are circumcised that are saying, I'm so proud to be a Christian, I'm a circumcised Jew. You just got to go, wait, whoa, 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 wait. We got to get this straightened out with you guys, too. Sure, absolutely. Because, and again, going back to Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul spends those three chapters there talking about that Jew Gentile relationship, and he's basically telling them, for you Jews, 
Don't get yourself all puffed up because the gospel came to you first. And to the Gentiles, don't you deride the Jews for what they did to Christ because that was all part of God's plan. And so there was that attempt to, to mesh it all together and make everybody equal. Everybody is, is the same within the church, even though that social distance existed as far as they were concerned in their mindset. Les? Yeah, I find this verse quite interesting uh, from the standpoint that while Paul and many of the uh, two different areas of influence, it was Peter who first went to the Gentiles. And I think, I put it here, I think he was honing in on it as this word effectively. Uh, I think this demonstrates God's wisdom. He knew that bringing the Gentiles in with the Jewish group. God knew exactly what was going to take place. And I think he assigned Paul to work and nurture with the uh, Gentile churches and Peter to work and nurture with the Judean churches so that they could work and shoot you out together. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was an effective thing. Uh, Paul's talking about Peter. And we're going to skip down in a minute. We're going to get to verse 11. Do you remember what happens in verse 11? Paul says, I withstood Peter to his face because he was to be blown. And we'll talk about that a little more when we get there. So Paul is, is recounting all this stuff that's happened. And in, in, verse, uh, in the last part of the, the verse there, Peter worked effectively. And yet he's going to point out a flaw that Peter had that Paul confronted him about. Now, Paul, Peter, two big, powerful personalities within the church. And Paul dares to call Peter on the carpet and say, you're wrong. Take away what you know about that. Just pick any given circumstance where you've got two powerful individuals butting heads with each other. What happens? Division. A division. It's, it's not good. Dave, do you have a comment? Oh, yeah. Also, he doesn't just mention Peter. He mentions Peter and David Scott. Mm -hmm. And Scott is the one Yeah, again, which is why he went up to Jerusalem and just met with that, that group there. Uh, so, again, the, the point is, here we could have had two strong personalities disagreeing over something, and that fuss could have gone, we call it viral today, don't we? And, and good thing they didn't have social media back then. It could have gone viral, and there could have been a, a schism within the church over these two. But there's no hint of that. Uh, there's no hint of that because, again, he's saying Peter worked effectively. Yeah, in verse 11, we'll talk about what Paul called him out on. And we're going to find Peter saying about Brother Paul, he teaches some hard things. But there, there seems to be no animosity between these two in spite of what we're going to read down in verse 11 when we get to it. And that, that tells us a little bit about their Mindset, I believe, about what happens within the church is more important than what's going on between us individually and personally. Les? Peter, no doubt, was a very strong 
own personality. Uh, but one great thing about Peter, when his followers pointed out, and I only about how long ago I knew this himself, uh, he was quick to say, yeah, that's right. I need to change. Yeah, absolutely. He he wept bitterly when he realized what he had done and uh, uh, with the denying of Jesus. So it Again, that speaks to when you have big personalities, there's always that chance for my personality to get in the way of what's best for the, the work, best for the church. And that's a, that's a struggle we all have to deal with because you know we all think we're kind of important, don't we? And we are important, but, but so, sometimes that it takes that balance of saying, okay, I might be wrong on this. Flo? The gospel eventually in all this history and story uh, overcomes mm -hmm. and succeeds. And at this point, even though, aside, aside from the personality of Peter and Paul, that Paul is complaining because the gospel was being compromised. Yeah. And that's what Peter was doing mm -hmm. when he was facing Holy Man. And I think get away from personality of fighters, whether it happened or not, I don't know, I think that would happen. But the gospel. Bottom line is God's plan was to God's plan to succeed. Mm -hmm. And he's going to use Peter, he's going to use the apostle, and he's going to use Paul. And Paul going to the Gentiles, again, I think God, if I can use this term, that was a strategist. Mm -hmm. If he sends Paul to all the Jews, his battles will be worse than it was. <laughs> sends to the Gentiles because that's where he wanted to establish his gospel and prove that the gospel was for all men. I think that was God's plan from the beginning to make that gospel effective. Otherwise, you could have sent Paul to the, all the Jews and try to you know, convince them. It would be very difficult. Even when he was doing this to the Gentiles, not only did he didn't want the Gentiles, but they weren't Jews, God said, This is where it's going to work. And eventually, the gospel succeeds because of that. Yeah. And I think the point you made is, is, is good for us. The reason Paul did that to Peter wasn't because. He saw an opportunity to gig him a little bit, or he disagreed with some little minutia. This was something that was compromising the gospel itself, and he couldn't stand for that, and Peter shouldn't be willing to stand for that, which maybe is why Peter was so uh, responded so well, because he realized the danger of what it was he was doing. And as a result of that compromising the gospel, which is the most important thing uh, that they were working toward and talking about. Yes. Depends on how you approach the situation, does it? Ellen? Yeah, we have to remember ourselves that peer pressure is a major motivation for us to change. You know, so here's Peter trying to change everything. He's got all this peer pressure. Of course, the Jews are saying to themselves, he ain't the Gentiles. He did this and that. What's the issue? What's the problem? And so that peer pressure caused Peter to come back towards that way. And then he realized what was going on, like you said. But even we today, I've seen brothers and sisters in the church that talk to somebody else in the church that changed their mind about who's the one who used to be, or changed their mind about sin. And those are the things that we have to be really careful with. Sure. And, and again, back to the point, the gospel needs to go forth. The gospel needs to be the key. And not my personality or somebody else's personality, uh, but, but where the gospel is, is not uh, compromised. And with James, Cephas, and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. 
that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which why I was also eager to do. So again, as we said earlier in, in our the earlier chapters of the book of, of Galatians, Paul was having to defend his apostleship. He was having to prove his credentials to be doing what he's doing. And here he points out that, yeah, Peter and I work together. Uh, James, Cephas, John, Cephas being Peter, obviously, perceived the grace had been given to me and they gave me the right hand of fellowship. And so there is no division between the mission to the Gentiles and the mission to the Jews. We're all on the same page. Even though I'm working with the Gentiles, they're working with the Jews, we're all working toward the same goal, and that's the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no, nothing else beyond that matters. And so he's setting up here his, his role in that. So, okay, now that we've got that settled, I've got the support of Peter, I've got the support of the pillars in Jerusalem, and we've worked this all out, we've got it all figured out. Listen to what i got to tell you about this gospel. And so he's, he's built his credentials, he's built his, his standing, and now it's time for him to talk about why he's writing and dealing with all of this uh, stuff. Uh, go to the Gentiles, they the circumcised. The only thing they desired is remember the poor. And Paul said, I was going to do that anyway, because that was important to him. And so that was the, uh, again, we talk about the Jerusalem Conference, Acts 15, where they get together to talk about this. And, you know, you'd expect a long treatise to be published from the, the conference in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, a small booklet. Uh, used to be, uh, and they may still do it in some, our, our Christian colleges would have lectureships. And in that lectureship, they would publish all the speaker's sermons. And I know Brady has a bunch in his library. I've got a bunch in my library of those books, and they're good resources. But most of those books are pretty thick for a weekend lectureship and all the things that were said. I, mean, I wonder how much could have been written about that conference in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And yet it all boils down to just a very small thing. Don't eat blood, take care of the poor. Just a few little things that they needed to, which indicates the, the unity there and the, the fact that they're already doing this stuff and these are the only things we need to, to, to talk about and, and make sure you know that we agree on because if somebody from the outside looking in might, might not understand that. And so again, the, the whole point of this is the gospel has got to go forth and the people involved in that need to get out of the way of the gospel and not be hindrances to it. And the same I think is true of us. Let's don't hinder the gospel because my ego gets in the way of it. Ellen? Yeah, we do know that there was a letter written after the council mm -hmm. that was delivered to all the churches. Yeah, all the churches. Yeah. So they wanted everybody to know in a united fashion what the decisions were from the top. Yeah, yeah. We're all united. Don't let that worry you. Here's what's going on. Now let's go back to preaching of the gospel. Now when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Why do you think Peter did that? I mean, other than the text explaining why he did. Dave? Then he went to 
Yeah. Peter was raised that way, wasn't he? I mean, his entire life, what was the mindset of his family and every other family in Judaism about the Gentiles? They were, the, yeah. They were nobodies. They were dogs. We don't have anything to do with them because we are God's chosen people. And again, we don't know how old Peter was during all of this time. But he wasn't a 12 year old kid. And so all his life, that's what he had known. And for God to come to him in Joppa the way that he did and convince him that the Gentiles were going to be allowed in to the gospel, yeah, he accepted that, but he had, let's say, 30 or 40 years of, of prejudice in the way. And it didn't get over just fine, just, just quickly. It's, we look at the idea of repentance, and we have an alcoholic who repents of being an alcoholic, never has another struggle with drinking again. It doesn't work that way, does it? Drug addict, whatever the case may be. It's not something that just changes overnight because that stuff that's ingrained in us is still there, and we've got to deal with it. And Peter well, specifically says he separated himself fearing those who were of the circumcision. He was afraid of his fellow Jews and what they were going to say and what they were going to think. And so he stepped away. And you can imagine on the Gentile side, they're saying, what are you doing? Why aren't you eating with us? Why are you just eating with them? And that just opened the door for tension within the, the body of Christ as a result of that. And so Paul comes in and he stood him to his face because he was to be blamed. And we don't get too much in the, in the uh, history of this, of what happened after that, but the assumption is it fixed it. Peter realized what he had done, and he was no longer willing to do that, but it was so bad that even Barnabas was carried. And it, it's, it's interesting that it says even Barnabas. What does that tell us about Barnabas? Yes. He was, he was special, wasn't he? He's the one who came and got Saul in the first place. He's the one that was the encourager. He was the exhorter. Uh, he seemed to have a special place within the, in the, the group of the 12. And to say even he was carried away tells us how bad that was, how bad it got. Because he, I think people looking at him would say he'd stay above the fray, but he didn't in this, in this case. Flo? Well, I think the lesson here also is that and for us is that Peter, as strong as he was, as strong as the character he was, as influential as he was, he was weak. Mm -hmm. And Barnabas was the same thing. Because they turned around and said, send him after the gospel and the truth. He walked away. So somebody kind of like challenged him. Instead of sending up, he walked away. So Paul was really not very upset about it. Because he was just basically accusing him of turning around. We do the same thing sometimes in our lives. We have surroundings, issues, or situations where instead of standing up for the truth and defending the truth of the gospel, we back out because maybe somebody else is going to do something wrong. <laughs> sure. There's going to be something different about it, whether they're friends, family, or colleagues, or whatever. And I think we're just as weak sometimes as Peter was. Yeah. Absolutely. When I say, I will never, what's going to happen? Yeah, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm likely to get myself in trouble. I will never. And, and again, we, we look at this, and yes, what Peter did was bad. And it was something that shouldn't have happened, and he should have known better, but we all should know better in our things we do that are wrong. We ought to know better, but sometimes we do it anyway. And again, the attitude and mindset could have been among some, well, Peter, you did this, you're done. You're out of here. We're not going to listen to you anymore. But fortunately, Paul corrected him. There was the understanding that there is repentance, that there is forgiveness. And yes, you make a mistake, but you can go forward from that mistake and be better in your service to God in spite of having done what you did. It's the unrepentant, unconfessed sins that get us in trouble. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins, John said in 1 John. And so we've got to understand that that's part of the, the process. And if Peter struggled with that, I'm going to struggle with that. You're going to struggle with that. We're all going to struggle with it because we're human, as Dave said. We're, we're human and we sometimes just don't do 
so well. All right, thoughts, comments, questions? But when I saw, let me get to my slide here. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel the Jew Gentiles to live as Jews? I said, why are you making them change who they are? Why are you making them change what they do? It is the point that he seems to be making there. You were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. You, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as a Jew. In other words, you eat with them, you're associating with them, and, and all of that. Why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? If you're, if you're going to go both ways, why are you compelling other people to go just one way? You ought to extend to them the same benefit of the doubt that you've gotten in that you're living with Gentiles, you're working with Gentiles, you're understanding Gentiles. Yes, you're a Jew, but as far as salvation goes, that no longer makes any difference. Where you come from, it's what you've done in, in, in obedience to, the, to, 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 to Christ. He goes on to say, but we who are Jews by nature, and uh, even the standard New International say by birth. So me who was born a Jew, bloodline, uh, that, that's what he's talking about and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. And so, we're Jews. We were born Jews. We weren't born Jenners, not the Jenners. sinners like the Gentiles. We weren't born in that. But verse 16, a man is not justified by the works of the law. We were born Jews. We follow the law. We live the law. We practice the law. And Paul is saying we are not justified by the works of that law. We're not. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's a whole change in the mindset about what their, their religion, their doctrine was all about. It's about faith. It's not about the works of the law because for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You can keep the law just as good as you can possibly be. And where are you? A lost sinner. It's only through faith in Christ Jesus that that sin can be taken away once and for all, perfectly, completely. And that's the whole point of, of the new covenant that God promised to make with, with Israel. You're not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. So it doesn't matter if you were born a Jew. Your Jewishness cannot save you. Doesn't matter if you were born a Gentile. Your Gentileness can't save you. What will save you? Faith in Christ Jesus. And that's the message of the gospel. That's the whole message of the gospel. And as humans, we want to make our checklists and, and have all these things we've got to do and nothing wrong with that per se. But at the same time, if I'm relying on my checklist and my faith's not what it ought to be, then I'm in, in bad shape. But it's by faith in Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ not by the works of the law. And again, that, he's circling back around to why he's writing this letter in the first place. It keeps coming back to that. The Jews are saying, no, you've got to keep the law if you're going to be faithful to Christ. And Peter, Paul is saying, no, you don't keep the law because number one, it's no longer valid. It was nailed to the cross. But number two, it couldn't save you in the first place. But faith in Christ Jesus can. So that's what we live and that's what we, we practice. So, again, back to the circumstance of Jew versus Gentile. The Jewish Judaizing teachers were saying they've got to become, in essence, Jews to be Christians. And Paul is saying, no. Jew, Gentile, none of that makes any difference. 
What makes a difference is faith in Christ Jesus. All right? Thoughts, comments, questions? But if... But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I don't know about you, but this verse, these verses are a little difficult, aren't they? Uh, just reading, reading through. While we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? What's he saying there, Ellen? Well, it's interesting because the uh, doctrines of the Seventh Day Adventists are exactly that, right there. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. Baptized in Christ, you become a Jew and follow the law. In a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is Christ therefore a minister? We're justified by Christ, and we are, ourselves are also found sinners. What's he talking about there? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, correct? So, to me, it doesn't seem like that's what he's talking about. We're all going to sin, we're all going to fall, we're going to confess our sins, repent of our sins, those are going to be taken care of. So when he talks about the idea that we ourselves are found sinners, What's the context he's talking about that in? Okay, it have to be in Christ. Verse 18, for if I build again those things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. Isn't he talking about the same thing he was talking about in the previous verses, the Old Testament law? It can't save you. And if, if I'm found to be a sinner, how? By going back to that law, you're making Christ a minister of sin. It can't be that way. It can't be that way. For if I build again on those things which I destroyed, he gave up the law. He said it's not there anymore. It's been done away with. And yet if I'm going to build on that done away with law, what am I doing? I'm making myself a transgressor. I'm sinning. By doing that. And so again, it's still back tied up into that Old Testament versus New Testament uh, disconnect from that. Great. I think verse 19 is one of the most profound things Paul ever said. The law leads me to the point that I put away the law and take the next step into Jesus. What makes true Jew, the righteous Jew, uh, the justified Jew. I come to the point and the law was my schoolmaster and brought me to this point that hey, now it's time to take the training wheels off the bike. Now it's time not to deny my culture but to acknowledge that righteousness is not through keeping the works of the law. The law has brought me to the point through the law that I die to the law and take that next step into Jesus. And for us Gentiles, I think we might just kind of glitch through these verses because it's, it's, it's not a cost, it's not a sacrifice on our part, but for anyone even today that takes pride in their Jewish heritage, and Jesus is anathema. Paul would have something to say to them about what is really the good Jew, the righteous Jew, the one who steps into Jesus. Yeah, and that's again, it's the whole point. Through for I through the law died to the law. He great pointed out as a schoolmaster to bring us where to Christ. In order to be in Christ, that law has to be done away with. We have to die to it and be born again in faith in Christ Jesus. All right, we're out of time. We'll pick up there a little bit next week and talk more about it. Appreciate it.